Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Impact Series. My name is Jessica Loretti, and I am the Managing Director of the Anthem Awards. We're so excited because today, this is our very first ever LinkedIn Live that we are testing out, and we have a wonderful guest with us today. We have Molly Tierney, Managing Director, North America Public Sector at Accenture. Thank you so much for being with us today, Molly. Thank you for having me. Um, we're just going to wait a, little, a minute here while we're waiting for folks to join. I'm just going to talk. So for those of you who are not familiar, the Anthem Awards is brought to you by the Webby Awards and is a new award and platform and community that is all about recognizing and celebrating and honoring purpose and mission-driven work from all around the world. We're currently in our second season. So we uh, have our open call for entries now. We hope that everyone across the impact industry working on all kinds of causes from all different corners of the world will enter their projects. And we have the final entry deadline is Friday, September 23rd. If you need information about the entry process, including categories or the causes that we honor and how you should submit your work, all of that information is at our website at anthemwards.com. We also have an amazing customer service team, Kara, who can help you with any questions that you may have. So you can email her at Kara at anthemawards.com and she can help with recommending categories and help explain any questions that you might have um, for the entry process. So we just encourage everyone to participate and be a part of the community that we're building. So this is our favorite part of the week. Every Thursday, we bring on our amazing winners and partners and judges and folks all across our community to talk about their work. So Molly, welcome to the Impact Series. I wanna say, you know, first congratulations for being yeah. an inaugural winner for your work and, and also just for all the work that you do every day in this space. So can you tell us a little bit about, share with the audience um, your VR project that was sure. the, the winning project for Accenture last year. Tell us about how the virtual experience solution works. Um, yeah. You know, why did you build this? Like, yeah. you know, what are your goals and all of that? Sure, happy to do it. So we built a solution at Accenture that we really think of as a learning method and it occurs in three parts. There's sort of immersion, reflection and analysis. And the immersion part is we put people in a headset and get them into an experience that is very realistic. That rep it's a digital twin, right? Replicates what you're gonna experience out in the world, but gives you an opportunity to practice managing the things that come between us all the time, the assumptions that we make about each other, the biases that are nudged to the surface, the how we are interpreting information, how we're developing opinions, all that stuff. And once we get folks out of the headset, they um, we bring them into seminars where they can all sort of unpack what they've been thinking and reflect on their work. And then we have user analytics where we can see how large groups of people have been behaving in a headset, sort of gives you an example to drive learning agendas moving forward. Now. We're relying a lot on all that's known about immersive learning, but it's, you know, sort of absolutely a very high impact way that people can learn. We did not turn our attention to compliance. Like we're not trying to get people to get it right. We're trying to get people to think about thinking, right? Mm. And we made some very particular choices. We're using actors on green screen, not computer generated images. It's voice yeah. activated so you don't have a clicker. And the one that we were very grateful to win the uh, inaugural award is focused particularly on the color line in the United States and how we, as a people, experience things differently um, across uh, the division between black and white. Um, and specifically, we drop people into an interaction with the family. And um, what the users don't know is that there's actually not one family, there's two families. And if every user is randomly sorted to one or the other. And the families are the same. They're wearing the same clothes. They're delivering the same lines. They live in the same house. They got the same names. The only difference is one family is white and the one family is black. So that means that people come into a seminar having experienced one situation, but half of them saw it with only a, played out with a white family, half only played out with a black family. And the user analytics shows the literature is leaping off the page, right? Like across thousands of uses. We, regardless of our demographic, we are significantly more likely to behave empathetically to the white family. We're significantly more likely mm. to find adult members of the black family, of the black family um, threatening and angry as compared to the white family. So it's sort of a real opportunity to look honestly 
at that mm-hmm. set of facts and then think together about, well, whoa, look, that happened. Like we all mm-hmm. did it, right? What could we do? How can we talk in seminar format about what are different choices we could make? How can I increase the space I have between stimulus and response when I'm interacting with the people around me? It sounds like it's such an amazing project. Can you tell us a little bit about where, did you do this as, um, is this like research gathering or is this to, is this like a learning and development for employees? Um, it was sort of, it were really focused because again, my work is in the public sector. So at Accenture, we work with governments all across the um, world, but I'm, I'm focused on North America and we're really thinking about how we can help governments mm. get to behavior change on the front line of how the mm. folks who are interacting with citizens in any public service are, it. Uh, man- are managing away from dynamics that make it hard to solve problems. Mm-hmm. Right. Because of unconscious bias and experiences. All of like it. That. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's so, such an important work. Can you talk, well, you mentioned briefly, but can you talk more about the efficacy of virtual reality in the education space? I know a lot of research has been done there. Why did you choose to use virtual reality? Oh, I spent a whole career in um, child protection before I joined Accenture, which is a very, very high risk field. Like you're making decisions about whether a kid is safe or not. And boy, you better hope you get that right. Wow, yeah. My experience was that all of the folks who are doing that work across the country are doing very high risk work, but it's on the job training, right? They're learning Mm -hmm. on the backs of the families that they're serving. And there really is no other high risk venture that is not learning on virtual reality, right? Like you all know, when you get on an airplane, that pilot is not learning to fly a plane with a commercial jet full of people. Right. He learned virtual right, reality. Like on the job. <laughs> right. right? And yeah. so that's got our, our, our sort of wheels turning about how do we give people an opportunity to practice in a really intense way, not pass, not a lecture, not looking at a flat screen, but how do you do it in a, in a way that is so intense and so realistic that it's the kind of practice that can transfer to when they're in real time. Hmm. Yeah, amazing. And VR has such an incredible ability mm-hmm. to transport people to another place to make them see things um, in another, you know, another perspective than their own and really transform. And, you know, it has a lot of ability in terms of behavior change. I know a really high yep. efficacy rate in that space as well. Can you talk about the, the stories and the training scenarios? Are those based off real life? Where do those come from? Or are those sort of made up? Uh, so the um we have a sort of library of narratives the narratives are works of fiction right but that you you should consider them sort of composites of real experiences because whenever we make a scenario we bring in folks who are really heavy hitters on this topic area who can tell the creatives the directors the script writers the casters what it's really like what it feels like what it smells like how people mm-hmm. react. And so for instance, we wrapped one this year on uh, a sort of trauma-informed care focused on adolescent mental health. And mm-hmm. we brought in a set of folks, they're staring down their thirties now, but they spent their teenage years in foster care. And so they really understand, right? Mm-hmm. And we just might them tell us stories, tell us more stories. How was it, how did that work, right? So, cause that's the only way to get it very, very real, mm-hmm. right? Just, the people you bring in, it depends on what we're working on, what we bring, what sort of advisors I think of them as, what we bring in to, it has to feel so real that anybody that puts the headset on, they can't have something that they're going to trip over. They can't have something that, well, that it wouldn't be like that. Because if they do, then they're out of immersion, right? And what we have to do is get them so immersed because in our work, of course, there's not an avatar. You're playing yourself. You feel like you're sitting in a room with someone talking to them and they're looking you in the eye and talking and conversing with you. And that sort of total absorption only works if there's not anything that would make you go, ah, I wouldn't be like that. Hmm. That's interesting. Can you talk about the, um, the impact? You, you mentioned briefly that there's like kind of staggering results or responses from the experience. You know, what were some, can you share any anecdotes of how people felt after the experience or maybe some changes that they saw to make, uh-huh. anything like that? I feel um, really proud of 
um, to have been present for the people who have embarked on learning in this way. And what I find is that that's what they find. They find more time between stimulus and response. They find their, their bias, unconscious bias, has been nudged to the surface of their consciousness and so they can see it and recognize it just before it's going to happen. Mm. Right? And so, therefore, instead of maybe in a group conversation, uh, a guy who might speak really quickly to hush a woman who spoke, they might ask mm. themselves, would I have done that if I was a man? Hmm. Right. Check on that. right, 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 right. And same across, across any line, across color, across gender, across any, anything right. that is a thing that divides us. It right. gives people a chance to stop and say, whoa, what happened? And I also feel like, you know, the work we did to curate our curriculum is really important to us that this not be a thing that silences anyone, that shames anyone, that blames mm. anyone, but it really is a way that invites people into reflecting in groups mm. in a way that expands the way, expands their ability to think about what they're doing. And that is enormously important to me that no harm has come to anyone that's done this. You know what I mean? Like they didn't, yeah. I have people aren't feeling like embarrassed or in trouble yeah. or right. judged because that's not going to help. Right. It's not going to help. Right. Exactly. Like what I, what yeah, I really yeah. want them to do is willfully step into self-imposed behavior change, which we all need to do. There's nobody, there's nobody innocent in this country on this yeah. point. Right, right. Well, everyone just comes from some sh different experiences, right? Oh, I think yeah. too, one of my favorite, um, I don't know if it's advice really, or like a saying, but something someone told me a long time ago is to really think about to not react, but to respond. And it's oh. kind of what you're saying. It's like that reaction moment of just like that quick to like that yes. gut feeling of like what you would always do. But instead, like, why don't we like stop and like think about it for right. a second, maybe take a moment to make sure you know, that we're thinking through how, how we're responding to these, these instances. But that's so important too about the point you made about, um, you know, people have to be open to these conversations, mm -hmm. right? You can't force this on anyone. It's not about shaming or judgment. No. Um, talk about, you had said, you know, before how in the past this work was done on the job. Why is it so important for us to continue to innovate ways that we approach the workplace, you know, the training and development or the way we're recruiting or all types of things that are happening mm -hmm. in the workplace. Like, mm -hmm. you know, using VR for, for this kind of thing is something, you know, nobody would have thought about a decade ago, right? Oh, right. It's such a new thing. So, you know, talk a little bit about why this is so important for us to continue to evolve um, the ways that we approach learning and development in the workplace. Well, you know, I guess I'd say that the workplace that I'm thinking mostly about is the public sector and particularly the public sector right. where there is an imbalance of power, mm -hmm. right? And so think about it, um, <clears throat> the police, mm -hmm. case managers and child protection, people that are distributing unemployment benefits, like all the power is with mm -hmm. the person who is the thing that's going to get distributed, right? And yeah. the person who needs something has no power. And the only way to shift that is to have the person who has the power get consciousness that they can read. It's okay. You can redistribute it. Right. It's okay. We would get to a different solution if mm -hmm. we could manage to balance that a little bit more. And I think that the point of innovation is that it's not working. <laughs> not mm -hmm. innovation is working, but I mean, the part where the part of public service, and I say this, I spent a career as a public servant. So I'm not mm -hmm. pointing the finger, I'm looking in the mirror, right? Yeah. Public service, by and large, it just isn't working. And mm -hmm. we could find ways that it, so all of the training that happens in public systems is, is about compliance, follow the rule. You're in trouble if you don't follow the rule, right? And I, yeah, they got to do that, right? And everybody's got to do compliance training because you got to follow the rules. Right. I think the, the gap we're trying to fill is, and also in addition to following the rules, you are all whole people who mm. we could shift the way this work is done. And frankly, the joy that the servant is getting out of it, all of that could get shifted. And the outcome would be 
the idea we have around public service is that it could lift people out of poverty. It could lift people out mm. of difficult situations that then, I don't know, right. we might actually pull it off. <laughs> might actually even solve some problems that about we're it. intending to solve, right? Yep. Doesn't that sound wonderful? Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love I love that. I think we all need that little bit of um, positivity today. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's great. Um, what's next for this project? Do you continue to uh, roll it out, evolve it? Oh, yeah. Do you have new new stories that are constantly going in? Constantly new stories. We're working on one now, which is really focused on very young children and trying to mm -hmm. increase our ability to understand what they're trying to tell us before they're using words to do it. Wow. Right? Yeah. Wish me luck because we're filming little itty bitty kids. It's totally <laughs> nutty. But it's yeah. I mean, good, luck. good luck. Yeah. But so I think that as I think about the future, we'll, of course, we, we're real committed to this as a way of learning. And what I'm interested in doing is continuing to sort of pick up by vibration what are the most urgent things mm -hmm. that people need to learn about? Like, I want to, what I go for is, what are the things that are keeping you up at night? What are the things you're really worrying about that are happening in your organization or in your field that you think something's going to really go wrong if we don't, if we can't turn this? It's mm -hmm. I'm not going for the fluffy stuff, right? I'm going for the jugular, right? right? That's the kind of stuff we're getting at. And also, right. I think that the technology changes. It's so much fun. Like right now, if you were to see, you could get in one of my headsets and go visit the kid who's the um, for whom we got this award. His name is Tori. And mm -hmm. I could do it here at my house. In the future, I imagine that you could get in the headset at your house at the same time I'm in the headset at my house mm -hmm. and we could go see Tori together. And like, together. Oh, fascinating. Yes. And I wonder if there's also ways that we can expand it. So imagine that you went through a couple scenarios and went through seminars and you had some learning, you were thinking differently about your work and we could add functionality that's metaverse focused like a coach on the go. It's an app on your smartphone that could help you think about mm. responding instead of reacting, right? Like I think I wanna think about what are the all the ways that we can support behavior change. Using Some other digital tools you mean yeah, that you could build. Yeah, and I wanna, I wanna stay yeah. way out on the edge of what the technology is doing. When I made the first avenues, that's what we call this thing avenues, the Accenture Virtual okay. Experience Solution. When I made the first one, I'd never been in VR before. And I sat down with some really, really smart people, never even been in a headset, Smat, sat wow. down with some really smart people. And I said, I, they had me look at a bunch of VR. And I said, okay, well, I think I want a little bit of this part and a little bit of this thing over here. And it's got to do this thing too. And they all said, oh, that's not yeah. possible. And then 12 weeks later, they'd done it. And I'm like, yeah, that's where we live, that's way out on the place. edge. Yes, I, impossible. That's my favorite thing. <laughs> right. All you have to do is dream it and then someone can build it and make it yeah. real. That's yeah. so interesting. I used to work in VR. And so I have seen so many people go through that first experience. And I can't tell you how many times people are skeptics and then are instantly converted. Right. Once they've had the first experience, they're like, wow, this is so, so much more profound than I thought it was going to be. Yes. I thought it was just a video game or whatever they, or they don't even know what it is. You know, still a lot of folks are still learning about what it is too. But yeah, it can be a very transformative experience for people. Yes. It's amazing. Um, okay, well, thank you so much for being with us today. Is there anything else, any other projects are on the horizon you want to tell us about or where can people find more about um, this project if they're interested in learning more and seeing more about it? If they're interested in learning more, maybe um, we can tap this in. It's at Accenture.com forward slash avenues, like the, like the road avenues. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great way to learn about the work we're doing. And, you know, uh, I think the sky's the limit. I'm looking forward to seeing all that the Anthem community does and how we can all bring to bear this kind of innovation in, uh, you know, real life-changing ways. I'm all in. Amazing. Thank you so much for all the work that you do. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for everyone out there. I hope you enjoyed our first ever LinkedIn Live. We're going to be <laughs> archiving this and we'll put it up on our website and we'll be sharing awesome. it in our emails going out in the next couple of weeks. Again, we hope everyone will participate in the second season of the Anthem Awards. Everything's on our website at anthemawards.com. Make sure you enter by the final entry deadline on September 20th. Third, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Thank Molly. You. Bye -bye. Have a great day.